An honest person? A person with strong moral principles. I hate to say it, but we're fearful these days of politicians. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that we've got people like Frankie and, and mm -hmm. Philip Morris that, that represent godliness because it's eluding us. We moved from two years ago a town called Hodgenville, Kentucky, and most of you probably never heard of that town. But believe it or not, it's the actual birthplace of Abraham Lincoln. Now, he made it to Illinois, and he was in Springfield, and he spent his time here. But as a child, he was born in, actually, it was called Hardin County at this time, at that time. It's now LaRue County. And uh, LaRue County actually has the monument very similar to the one in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, their monument has 56 steps, just like the one in D.C., because the 56 represent uh, his age when he died. Uh, their monument, everything at the top has 16. There's 16 stanchions uh, uh, because it's an enclosed room. Uh, there's 16 windows in that room, and all of those represent the fact that he was the 16th president. Inside of their monument is the actual cabin where he was born. But you know what I'm telling you all that? You remember what his nickname was? Honest David. Honest David. It's important, brethren. It's important that we have integrity in every aspect of our life. Jesus starts out there in verse 33. He says, You have heard it has been said by the, them of all time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt, shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. And then he goes into this thing uh, in the next several verses. He starts talking about don't be swearing by heaven, don't be swearing by earth, don't be swearing by, by God himself or what have you. And I wrote those down, okay, one by one. Uh, even he goes on to say your head. Don't swear by your head because you can't change any of that. Let me bring this into modern day terminology. You ever heard anybody say, I swear on a stack of Bibles? You ever heard somebody say that? Wonder why? Because they know that you might be questioning their integrity. I swear on my mother's grave. Boy, that gets really, really serious, doesn't it? But sometimes we have to do it for the same very reason. You see, the, the only thing different between the first century and the 20th, the 21st century is terminology here, okay? It's still a matter of swearing, as we saw that word a while ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, as it was used in, uh, in, in the New Testament, uh, it, it, it actually meant in reference to uh, more technical things. When I, uh, when I was a, a young man, I had to go to court. And I don't even remember the purpose. It was for something, I, again, it's been so long ago, I don't remember. And uh, if you've ever been to court and having two sons in law enforcement, they spend a lot of time in the courtroom. One of the first things they do is they hand you a Bible. They make you put your hand on that Bible. Uh, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God. You know what my dad told me? He said, you tell them, I am not going to swear, but I will affirm. Okay? Um, I'm not sure about all that, brethren. I've studied this very, very deeply. Uh, I, I think that what God is trying to say in this context is that you should be of such integrity, nobody would even have to ask you whether or not you, quote, swear or, or affirm. Mm -hmm. Until about 20 years ago that, that, that I learned the word semantics. And if you're not familiar with that word, it's just the way that we use words, the way that we play with words, if you will. Uh, and semantically, swear and affirm are just the same thing. It may be that we change the word to sound a little bit better, but the, the thought, the concept is still there, the very, very same. You know, when, when Vito was, was reading that, it hit me. And I never thought about this before until I was listening to somebody else read it. And he had a very, very valid point there. You can say what you want about Pontius Pilate. And after he, when they said, for him to say, uh, uh, for him to, to write, he said he was the king of the Jews. You know what Pilate said? I know that Dino does. What I have written, I have written. 
He was very, very adamant about that point. And it was his wife, his wife, that, as Dino had pointed out, that had told him, he said, she said, I had this dream. You, you should have no part with this man whatsoever. Guess what Job's wife told him? A little different, wasn't it? Now, here's a man that we got to question their integrity uh, for conscious pilot. And here's a man that never lost his integrity from the very, very beginning. And when we get to the whole book, we're going to find out that after Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, even Elihu, when you look through all of these different people, in the very end, Job stand, stood with a man of, as a man of integrity, a, a, a righteous, upright man. Kind of like the way that the Cornelius is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we, but what did Job's wife say? Why don't you just curse the Lord and die? Remember Job's response? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me ask you a question, because when I was preparing the sermon, I thought about this question. How would you react? How would you respond if everything you owned was taken away? Someone said that at that time in the world that Abraham might have been the wealthiest in one part of the world and Job the wealthiest on the other. You didn't count wealth by your stocks and bonds of your bank account. It was more by animals. And if you look at the amount of animals that that man had at that time, he was quite a wealthy man. Within just a very short period of time, they were all wiped out. He was such a righteous man that he made, uh, after his children got together, he made special sacrifices. He did whatever it took to make sure that they were purged or cleansed of whatever sins that they might have. Lost ten children at one time. Diane and I are blessed with four boys. Can't imagine losing a single one of them. But I had no idea what it would be like if I lost all four. I don't think any of us could understand that. All of his fields are burned. All of his animals are destroyed. And you can understand, if you will, why Job's wife said, why don't you just curse the Lord and die? You can also understand that real integrity means that you accept God when you have everything, but you continue to accept him when you have nothing. That's the very, very powerful point that Job presented for each and every one of us as we think about this, this whole situation here. I have never in my entire life, brethren, and I think about it, I was talking to somebody about this just this week, uh, Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite. I believe to this day that those were men of, men of integrity. Did you know that the guy that's actually sitting on uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, for NBC News, he's the guy in the evening, what's his name, Diane? Lester Holt. Uh, Lester Holt. Did you know that Lester Holt is a member of the Church of Christ in New York City? Okay. That he teaches a Bible class, that he goes there regularly? I hate to say this, but I'm not so sure that NBC is always telling the truth. Or even if they will put the truth out there a lot of the time. First time in my life, brethren, I've ever heard the term fake news. Isn't that tragic? Isn't it really, really sad where we have arrived in our country? Isn't it so drastic and so serious that we have to worry about who we choose as a president? Because it could impact us so severely. Especially the things that are precious to each and every one of us. Brother, I, I'll be honest with you. I worry about whether or not we're going to be able to meet next Sunday here in this building. I've never had that fear in my entire life, 46 years of preaching. Never, I have when I was, was up in Russia, when I was in the Ukraine, but not here in these United States. I think about these things often, daily, if you will. I think about when we talk about integrity. I think about Luke chapter 8, for instance. Luke chapter 8, Jesus talks about the 
the parable of the sower. And, and I often, you know, you, you, you drive down, not right down Gallagher, okay? But especially by the time you get on their way and, and get back over there to Chicago Highway 53 and you start going out toward where we live in Elwood and Wilmington. Farms everywhere. All kinds of different crops. Now today, a guy climbs up into a cultivator or a tractor or a combine or whatever piece of equipment that he needs on that particular day. And it's heated and it's air conditioned, it's got a radio in it, and uh, pretty much done by that machine. But during biblical times, there was a woman that had an apron that she put that seed in, or he, and they would take that and they would broadcast it. Uh, and, and not all of it fell right in those furrows where you needed it to actually grow. And that's what Jesus was illustrating when he talked about the parable of the sower. But he talks about that seed that got right there in the place that it needed to be. You know what he said? It fell into a, quote, good and honest heart. Honest heart. Just now, people were talking about, like, for instance, uh, in John chapter 8, you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. So many times, uh, Jesus uh, the old, uh, in the book of Solomon said, by the truth and sell it not, the book of Solomon. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, by the truth and sell it not. That's what we know. That's what we see. That's what we understand. Every one of us. Now, here's our point here. When Jesus says, don't be swearing by all of these different things, he says, let your yea be yea, your nay be nay, your yes be yes, your no be no. But then there was a time, and, and, and I think about like your Cindy's father, who's a, a, a preacher, uh, and, and so many of you, uh, the house I know, they've got preachers in their family, and, 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 and many, many religious leaders. There was a time, maybe just one generation back from some of us, where a handshake was all it took. There wouldn't be several pages of documents and all kinds of different stamps and, and, and witnesses of all of the things that we have to do today to verify that what we're saying is the truth. It was our work. You look, the book of Revelation says in chapter 21, verse 8, the book of Revelation, verse, chapter 21, verse 8, says that all liars will have their place in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. There's a punishment for liars. Brethren, the last two weeks, our country has been deluged with all kinds of questionable information. And it didn't start there. It's been months ago that that's happened. Just outside of this wall, there's a voting booth. And there will be people, there will be people determining the fate of our country. And it's important. It's very, very important for each and every one of us. I have remained my entire preaching career apolitical. And I feel that I should, I need to as a preacher. But there are things that really impact me. My wife, my child is still with me. My grandchildren, my other three sons and daughters are all back in Georgia. That concern me, concern me greatly. Brethren, we have the ability to make something happen that's right. This morning, as you think about your life, you think about the sermon, you think about your relationship with your God, if in any way you might be subject to Christ's invitation, we certainly invite you to come. All together we stand. You want to be